Hello, welcome everybody. This is a, another of the Island Artist Gallery's Zoom talks with local artists and we're pairing with nature sex. And this evening, Deirdre LeBounty, who geologist and grew up in Sitka and knows the area well, is going to be talking about the geology of Kruzov um, for anyone who's not here, Kruzov Island is our view out our front windows for the most part in the home of Mount Edgecombe, which is a, our incredible volcano. And um, part of our, you know, it's a, it's a major part of our world. So I've always been fascinated by the different um, aspects of it. And hopefully you're just going to clear up some of those questions. Um, welcome to more people tuning in. Um, um, thank you all so much. I'm going to ask that everyone mute their microphones and if you have questions to put them in the chat and then whenever there's a, um, you know, if there's a question, Ellie, our technical guru is going to be monitoring the chat and she will put it through to the person. And then at the end of the talk, um, we'll have a little wrap up session that if anybody has any questions or if you have any feedback you can see in the future or um, things we could be doing to make it more interesting, let us know. Um, and with no further ado, I want to welcome Deirdre LeBounty, who will talk in just a few minutes, but Lisa um, Tease Conway is a wonderful local artist and she is going to share some of her pen and ink techniques with us and with watercolor washes. And so please feel free to paint, draw, you know, sketch any, you know, any form that pleases you along with us and enjoy the evening. Lisa, you're on. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Hi there, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to show you some of the examples of what I've done in the past and what I'm going to be doing along with um, Deirdre's talk today. And it is watercolor and pen and ink mixed together. So these are some samples of some past work that I've done. And you can see, if I can't orientate it right, there we go. Some, I've done some pen and ink sketching in there and then I've come back with a watercolor wash just to color things and make it a little bit more interesting. These are fairly light ones and then We've got a tree and a rock, which is a little reminiscent of what we're going to be doing today. Um, and then I did a sample one of a really quick sample, little tiny one of what we're going to do today. But I'm just going to go ahead and get us started really quickly. This is the photo that we've been provided. Um, this is on our website. If you don't have it with you, um, that is islandartistgallery.com and under the stories section. And then this story, um, you can see it there and do your basic sketch off of that. But because it's art, you know, it doesn't have to be exact. We're not scientific illustrators here. So just remember to have fun with it. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start walking you through the sketch part of this. I'm going to hide my, my face over here. So, all right. So to do this, what I do first is a really, really light sketch. And I don't know if you can hardly see it, but I've got, I'm just using a mechanical pencil here, but I'm just doing the basic rectangle box of this rock here. And then I'm gonna pull out some key features. Like this is this mossy bit right here. And I just did a little circle there and we've got some moss cascading over here. We've got a nice tall tree coming straight up and then some bushy hemlocks, it looks like maybe over here and coming off of the edge. And then some nice little bump out there, more of a mossy plateau right here and some moss clinging to the edges over here. And then it comes down and we've got that um, wild celery all in a little pool on the bottom. Um, so, Usually I just do this really, really basic sketch and then I go ahead and just get started with my, my ink. So let me grab my 
a third pen here. Um, where did it go? Here it is. So sometimes I'll use the Micron 0 0.505. That's a nice size. Sometimes I'll use a Sharpie marker as in the, um, as in the Sharpie marker that I don't have readily available. <laughs> um, but the main thing about whatever pen you're going to be using with this, if you're doing a watercolor wash on top, you want to make sure your ink is waterproof. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a big runny inky creation rather than what you might have had in mind. <laughs> so make sure that your it, archival ink is another way of them saying that sometimes, but you want to look for waterproof and fade proof. I don't know if you can read that, but that actually says it right there on the pen. It's waterproof. So when doing water on top of your ink, you definitely want waterproof ink. But I'm going to go ahead and get started on this. And I'm going to start with my key features and just work off of that and do some basic detailing. Um, but I'm going to start this and let Deirdre take over here and do her talk. And you can just watch this as we as we go. Hi. Um, so I'm Deirdre. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Watch me um, work on that for a second. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, <laughs> classic Zoom talk, right? Um, let's do that one. So, is my presentation showing up all right? Can I get some <laughs> confirmation? It looks good to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm Deirdre. Uh, I grew up in Sitka um, and I currently live here again. Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and um, I'm studying geology. So I'm gonna turn my video off to conserve power. Um, so today I'll give you, be giving you a little bit of background on the geology of Kurzaf Island. So, oh no. Oh, that's out. So, uh, most of the information for this talk um, is coming from uh, this book. So, it's the Mount Edgecombe Volcanic Field, a Geological History uh, by Jim Riley, uh, published in 1996. Um, it's a USDA Forest Service pamphlet. Um, and it's freely available online. Um, and, you know, the information is good and up to date. And while a lot of it is um, a little scientific, he goes into some background on a lot of the concepts in the book. Um, it's a really cool resource, resource for us here in Sitka. So I'm going to be looking at some big questions. So why are these rocks that we see um, on Kurzoff Island in that place? And um, what are those, why do those rocks look like they do now? Um, sort of to tie us in with the art question. Um, first off, why Kurzoff? Um, and as Pat pointed out, um, this is, you know, one of those big symbols of Sitka. Um, Mount Edgecombe is this huge volcano. It looks really different from anything else in the local area. Um, it's huge, it's omnipresent, it's sort of <laughs> lurking off on the western horizon, um, looking very charismatic. So, you know, we know it's different. Um, and its geology is also different. So zooming way out, um, Sitka is 
right on the edge of the North American tectonic plate. Um, we're about 40 miles away from the plate boundary in downtown Sitka. Um, from Mount Edgecombe area, it's more like 20 miles away. And so all the rocks in Sitka and um, all the rocks in the surrounding area are defined by the fact that we're right on the edge of that boundary. Zooming in a little closer. Um, so here's a geologic map of the area. Um, this is uh, Sue Carl et al's um, publication from 2015. Um, you can see all these stripes on it. And those stripes, um, those green stripes all over there are um, running parallel to the edge of the of Baranoff Island. Um, and they are running parallel to the plate tectonic boundary. The two stripes closest to town um, are um, this uh, dark, darkish green color and this lightish green color just here in Sitka Sound. Um, those are the Sitka Greywacky and the Kaz Complex. Um, and these are sedimentary rocks and they were formed in an ocean environment about 100 million years ago. So um, dinosaurs are walking around on land and these rocks are forming in the edge of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so you can also see there are all these pink blobs on that map. And so pink blobs in a geologic map mean um, intrusive rocks. And uh, these intrusive rocks are um, rocks that cooled from liquid magma, from melted rock. Um, and they were in place about 50 million years ago in those sedimentary rocks. Um, and so you can see one down by um, sort of Goddard Hot Springs area. And you can see one on the edge of Kruzoff Island as well. Um, and then there's this other zone. Um, there's this other brightly colored zone uh, on the southern half of Kruzoff Island. And um, for geologic maps, um, red means volcanic. And we saw those big pictures of a volcano earlier. Right now we're zoomed in on that volcano on the geologic map. Um, and uh, that's what we're getting into today. So um, we've got those volcano and those volcanic rocks to go with it. Um, so again, to sort of zoom out a little, um, I've been throwing around the words like sedimentary and maybe not igneous or metamorphic yet, um, but those are the three major types of rocks. Um, so sedimentary rocks, um, this is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Um, they are rocks that um, formed from eroded pieces of other rocks or substances that were squished together um, later into a rock. And so when you squish together sand, you get something like sandstone. If you squish together mud into a rock, you get something like shale. Um, one of the big features of these rocks is that they form um, layers over time, sort of like we see in the Grand Canyon. Um, in terms of igneous rocks, um, second rock type, igneous rocks are rocks that cooled from liquid molten rock. Um, and so there are two different kinds. Um, the first kind is intrusive rocks. Uh, so intrusive igneous rocks formed underground, under the Earth's crust, and they take a long time to cool. So um, over that long time cooling, they can create, um, so they can form large crystals, large mineral crystals, um, to the point that they're entirely crystalline when you look at them. They're entirely made up of little crystals. And um, on that big geologic map earlier, um, those big pink blobs, those are intrusive igneous rocks, things like granite and tonalite and granodiorite. Um, there's also extrusive or volcanic um, igneous rocks. And we're gonna be talking a lot about those 
today. Um, and those are igneous rocks that cooled at or near the surface. And they don't really have time when they're cooling to form and grow big crystals. Um, crystals take a little while to form. They take a little bit of energy to form. Um, and so you're not going to get big um, crystals, or at least you're not going to get rocks that are entirely made of crystals when they're cooled quickly. Um, and those are extrusive or volcanic rocks. And uh, last of all, there are metamorphic rocks. And um, metamorphic rocks are just, you know, rocks that have been altered by the effects of pressure or temperature. Um, and they've been altered completely into different rocks. Um, so you can kind of see, if you look at this photo, um, there are these bands of color on it. And unlike those bands of color on the Grand Canyon, these stripes are going in crazy chevrons. This rock has been folded up and it has um, become a metamorphic rock through the effects of pressure. So um, getting back to Mount Edgecombe and Kruzoff Island, um, back to our uh, volcanic rocks, um, what happened? So why are there igneous rocks here? Why is there a big volcano right there on Kruzoff Island? Um, so geology, in geology terms, you can't really get to those big existential questions. Um, but somewhere around at least 600,000 years ago, um, some of the rock underneath the Earth's crust in the Earth's mantle, um, which has a different chemical signature than the Earth's crust, um, it started melting. And that magma slowly started moving towards the surface of the earth. Um, and this, this melting and this movement was probably the result of the fact um, that the tectonic plate boundary is right there. Something happened along that boundary that caused these rocks to melt. So at least what we know is that 600,000 years ago or so, um, that molten rock started flowing across the surface of um, what little island there was there beforehand. Uh, so this is basalt from the beach on Kruzoff Island. Um, and you can kind of see these crazy sort of wrinkles in the top of it. And those wrinkles are actually the effects of that rock cooling as it flows. So it cools and it flows and it folds onto itself. Um, here's a picture from Hawaii of rocks doing the same thing. So this is liquid magma cooling into basalt rock. Um, same has happened on the beaches at Kruzoff. Um, and it's forming those same ropey textures, those ropey um, cooling formations that you can see in that rock on Kruzoff. So here's a, um, here's a picture of Low Island off the coast of um, Kruzoff. And you could really see here that um, those basalt layers, they're really flat. That um, magma that was cooling on the surface of the earth, it flowed a long way into a really flat sheet before it stopped. Um, so um, one of sort of the characteristics of um, magma is that as magma has more silica in it, it gets more resistant to flow. It gets more viscous. Um, and it starts, rather than flowing out in flat sheets, it actually sort of starts piling up. And that's what happened next in the story of Kruzoff Island. Um, the rocks started piling up. And so you get things like 
um, this andesite flow um, on the southeastern cor corner of Kruzov Island um, that um, instead of flowing out in this thin sheet, the rock is now um, piling up and it's piling up and forming um, these hills and mounds on the edge of Kruzov Island. Um, and so Lisa is actually, as far as I can tell, she's going to be drawing one of those piled up mounds of rock. Um, they're cooling in place, they're forming these big hills of volcanic rock. And it's those same um, types of formations on Kruzov um, that have some caves in them. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't have a good picture of that. Um, so I brought in some pictures of different caves. And so the caves on Kruzov on the coast are, they're not solution caves. So on the left side of this slide, um, there's sort of some tiny solution caves. Um, this is an arch um, in marble on Chichigaf Island. Um, and that marble um, is slowly dissolving in the water and forming these arches. Um, and so that's, that's a sort of form of solution cave. On the other hand, the caves on Kruzov are more like lava tubes. Um, so on the right here um, is a cave in California at Lava Beds National Monument. Um, as that lava cools, it's, um, the outer edge of that flow is cooling more quickly than the inside of the flow. So um, the outside, when the outside cools and the inside will just keep moving on downhill. So the inside will just keep flowing. And at a certain point, it can flow all the way out. So you're left with a void. Um, and those are lava tubes. And there are little bits of those in the edge of Kruzov Island. Um, so in a lot of cases, the ones on Kruzov are also, they're helped along by the ocean. Uh, they're not truly, um, they're dissolving a little, um, but they're mostly just being weathered gradually away. Um, not dissolving like something like limestone or marble would be, and not sort of on the same time scale. I mean, depending. So, moving on, um, eventually, about 100,000 years ago, the lava um, gets so silica rich and so viscous and is starting to pile up more and more that um, the lava almost just piles up around vents. So it's piling up in the spot where it's extruded to the surface, where it meets the surface of the earth. Um, and we get big volcanoes. So Mount Edgecombe uh, starts piling up and a few other cones start piling up, sort of forming a line across the island. Eventually, the lava gets so silica rich um, by 14,000 years ago um, that rather than actually flowing at all, um, you know, it's getting more and more viscous and it's containing even more elements um, that like to form gases. And because that lava is so viscous, rather than you know, making a nice path for those gases to escape, um, the lava just explodes and we get volcanic ash. Um, and that ash goes 
all over the place. Um, and by all over the place, I mean 100 miles away. Places like Yakutat and Juneau, um, there are signs of ash from Mount Edgecombe's various eruptions in those places, or at least a few of their eruptions. Um, in Sitka, um, there are lots of places around town where you can see ash from Mount Edgecombe. Um, I think the estimate in town is that there's about three feet of ash. So if you go um, closer to Mount Edgecombe, there's a lot more ash. Um, someplace like uh, this hill on the southern side of Kruzov Island, you know, it's entirely made of ash. There was a lot of ash. Um, and this kept happening for about 10,000 years. There were multiple eruptions and multiple um, times that ash spewed into the sky above Sitka Sound. So something, it might look something like this. So this is a, um, a photo of a volcano from Papua New Guinea. Um, I like the kayak too. <laughs> um, so it might have looked something like that. The big cone, the big cloud of ash pouring out into the sky. Um, so what about glaciation? You know, um, so that ash, that ash time period I was talking about was about 14,000 years ago to about 4,000 years ago. Um, and around that time, and just before that time, um, some other things were going around on the Earth's surface. Um, so the last ice age was winding down. Um, the world was warming up. Big sheets of ice were melting all across the globe, including um, places like Southeast Alaska. So one of the questions scientists are really into, are really interested in right now with regards to Mount Edgecombe is the coincidence or not of that time frame. Were those big eruptions actually triggered by melting glaciers? Um, And, you know, people are still working on it. That's one of, you know, the big intriguing questions. Um, but even without knowing, you know, exactly why um, that ash was spewing out, it's something that's um, omnipresent in Sitka. Um, it's something that um, is all over the place. You can find it in your own backyard. You can see Mount Edgecombe um, from downtown on a, on a clear day. Um, uh, but it's, a, it's an ever-present thing. And um, it's something we can look to as a window into the past. And so, um, I guess I just want to encourage you to um, get out and about in town um, and, you know, enjoy the different shapes that different kinds of lavas can build up into. <laughs> okay, um, that's all I have. Um, back to Lisa. All right, that was really interesting. Thank you, Deidre. Um, <laughs> no, it was really interesting. Like you said, omnipresent. It's always been in the back of our minds, back of our yards. Um, I know digging in the dirt as a kid, coming across the ash layer and being like, wow, what is this? So, and then seeing formations like this and like St. Lazaria, Low Island, all that stuff has always been really interesting to me. Um, so thank you for giving us a little insight into it. And, but to talk about the art here, I'm just kind of filling in at the moment and kind of trying to shape out my piece a little bit here. Um, I'm going back and forth between dotting and then line work to try and give different textures there. Um, 
So like the moss is soft. So I'm trying to give it more of a dotted texture and it's coming down and just adding in a little bit of shading. I'm gonna come back here with, um, oh, with the watercolor here to give this even more interest and, and have it look interesting <laughs> in different ways. Um, and then like the, all the different foliage, foliage, I'm trying to play with that a little bit. There's ferns in here. You can't really see them yet, but once I come back with some color, there'll be a little bit more to see at that point. Um, if anybody has any questions for myself or Deirdre, please feel free to, to ask in the chat or let us know. And if anybody is, following along with the drawing and wants to know how I'm approaching something or any questions like that at all, don't be shy, <laughs> let us know. Right now, these little teardrop shapes that I'm putting in there, those are little ferns that are po po poking out of the, of the moss there. So they'll be a different color green from the moss when I paint and that will accentuate them that much more. Um, And I'm just dotting to get some shadow in there. Lots of dots. Um, I really like to use different textures with my pens and sometimes I'll even use different sizes of pens to try and create a, a light versus a dark just within the pen drawing itself. I, I often do just solely pen drawings and um, so the colors, I don't always work with color. And so when you're just doing black and white, you really have to find ways to make it work with you and be a little bit more interesting than black and white. So I've, I've actually seen some artists recently have gray shades of pen, which I think is really interesting. I kind of want to investigate that and see what I can accomplish with a gray pen. And they've done really intricate background work with gray that doesn't overwhelm the piece. And yet it's still so interesting and detailed and Someday <laughs> I'll get myself a great pen and play right along with that. But, but we're gonna be adding watercolor here really soon and getting a little bit more interest in our pieces that way as well. The fun thing about art is you can do anything and, and just have fun with it and not have to worry about doing something wrong because it's art. And, it's the experience. It's not so much the piece at the end of the day. It's what did you learn? What did you experience while creating that piece? That's the most important, um, I think. <laughs> My humble opinion right there. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, would love to hear them. So this is John Stein and uh, I had a question for Deirdre. Um, I saw an illustration or a photograph, I guess, of snow covered Kruzov with a slight, level, uh, slight layer of snow. And there were dozens of obvious uh, volcanic vents hidden in the woods and that kind of thing, which I thought was quite fascinating. And, uh, and then I, I guess at one point, that's a, a thing to pay attention to. And then the other is on, on walks on the cross trail where there's cuts into the, um, into the bank and the uh, volcanic ash, you can clearly see layers of organic material. So obviously, at least apparently, um, the volcanic eruptions ceased long enough for vegetation to take root, and then were covered subsequently by you know additional uh, eruptions and. This is, it's a fascinating area to live in and to see all this stuff sort of close up. So, and thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. And Pat, uh, you were amazing. Keep it up.
yeah um yeah it's 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 really cool how fast those um all those growing things come back um after eruptions and i think um there is a talk um <laughs> the the natural history seminar series um years ago that i watched um with derek sykes and they were studying um you know how fast creatures and plant life and insects all return to um one of the islands in the aleutians after um um a big eruption and it's really fast and it's especially you know really fast in geologic terms um so there were you know lots of little times when you know plants could get all um happy and make an ecosystem for themselves again before that next big explosion it's really cool when you when you made the uh uh, remark that the glaciers may have caused or uh, had some effect on on the eruption was that this the uh, effect of the glacial uplift that we hear about that as the weight of the thousands of feet of ice melts away that it took pressure off the earth's crust and something broke yeah yeah from that glacial uplift and you know moving things around Um, I actually have a question for Deirdre as well. Um, do you know how long ago the last estimated eruption took place? I think it was something like a little over 4,000 years ago. It's not that long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course, Edgecombe, as we know it, is is it dormant or is it extinct? Um, I think that's one of those things that it depends on who you talk to. Um, I think there are official definitions for dormant and extinct um, in like geologic terms. So like the time since last eruption. Um, but I think for the, um, you know, for, for, for all intents and purposes, extinct. And then also I wanted to ask, I'm shooting a lot of questions out there for you, Deirdre, sorry. Um, about the fault lines. I know that you said that we're really, really close to one of them, but isn't there like quite a few fault lines right in our vicinity or? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, oh, I wonder um, if you look at sort of um, the map of Southeast Alaska, um, you can see all those, you know, big bodies of water, um, like Chatham Strait. Um, and some of those are, you know, they're called straits, but they're really, really straight. Um, I mean, all of those are fault lines. Um, they are, you know, weak points in pieces of rock um, where glaciers could plow through. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're next to a lot of fault lines. Cool. I am just filling in a little bit of the shadowy places in the rock here that I really want to be really dark, but I am about to pull out the watercolors. Um, you can paint with any kind of watercolors you might have on you and I have a, a nice little traveling set so it's really nice and compact that I use a lot. I don't travel with it a lot but I use it a lot. <laughs> um, 
And I'm just gonna go ahead and get started on that. So I still got my pencil line in there, but I didn't really fill in this bushy area very well, did I? I guess I got a little distracted by the trees. Um, so I'm gonna, I can tell there's a different type of plant up here. Um, it's probably some kind of berry bush of some sort. And we've got maybe a spruce hidden in there, hemlock, several species of trees clinging to this, this rocky surface. It's kind of a nice illustration of what Deirdre said about the plant life coming back so quickly. And this one actually coming back right on top <laughs> of, of some of those rocky formations. So I'm fairly happy with it right now. I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my watercolors. Um, this is the Van Gogh's super fine quality. <laughs> oh no, am I frozen? Can you guys see me still? Okay, my computer froze. But if you guys can see me, let me know. Okay, looks like it's working. Um, yeah, so this is pretty messy. I'm, it reflects my personality. <laughs> and then I've got just a, a tub of water here and a regular paintbrush here. Um, see, there's things in the chat. I haven't been checking the chat. Okay, that's yes, you can see. Okay, so paintbrush goes in the water and that's what activates your watercolors. I think I'm going to get started with um, the moss. So I want a little bit of a yellowish brownish color green. It's not like super fine. It's not Kelly green or anything. It's not like the wild celery we have down here. So I've got a little bit of that already going on over here. It's almost a line, but adding in this kind of a yellow in there and a little bit of this like, we'll call that burnt sienna. And, and then just a touch. I know I'm being messy with them, but I'll just clean them up and they'll just be fine. And I like to have really pigment heavy in my watercolors, so not actually a whole lot of water. So one advantage of that is it dries really fast and it also is just feels nice going on the paper, I feel like sometimes. And sometimes if it's too dry, um, I can add water straight to the paper and that will reactivate the pigments too. And this is a little on the dark side, but I kind of like it anyway, so I'm gonna go for it. And with watercolors, most paints, you can always add layers to it. So after this is done drying, I can actually come back with a little bit lighter shade, a hue of this, and get a little bit more highlights in there. I'm not combing all the way to the top here because there's actually a bit of like nice green, green grass on top of that layer of moss. So another nice thing about watercolors is um, you can like work on one section of your painting and move around the painting and it can be dry by the time you come back to it. If you're working with like this kind of technique there's a lot of techniques of anything in life out there. Watercolors in particular, I feel like there's the layer technique, the wet on wet, wet on dry. There's a lot of things you can do to make it do different things for you. And one thing I believe um, is if you want to be good at anything in life, you just have to practice. And that also means experimenting and trying new things and, and trying the wet on wet, trying the dry on dry. So if you're interested in any of this at all, just explore it and try it and, and do it over again and do it a little different and then do this and then do that. And the more you do that, the more you explore and you teach yourself 
the more knowledge you'll have in whatever it is you're pursuing. All it takes is practice. And the interest and want to practice. So I'm just gonna get all my kind of yellowy brown moss in there. And I'm not worrying too much about staying within my lines because this is gonna dry really fast and I can come back and paint on top of that. Um, if you paint right on, like if I came with another color and put it right on top of that, then it would actually mix on the paper. The colors would mix on the paper, which can be fun too. But if, if you're not wanting that, then you have to kind of wait for your paper, your ink, your paint to dry. And also you don't have to just like brush it straight on and get a nice black color. You can do little hashing techniques to get a little bit of shadows mixed in there. I really like how this moss is kind of clung to any kind of um, surface that it could, any little nook and cranny it could grab onto. It's, it's grabbed onto it. Moss is pretty amazing. It can grow in so many different inhospitable climates, it seems. It doesn't take much to be able to get moss to grow, it feels like sometimes. So this is kind of a sprucey green. I'm gonna use this as the base for some of my trees. And so I'm gonna lay this in mostly and then I'll come back and do more layers on top because that's much, that's a nice color, but it's a lot lighter than the finished product that I want to achieve here. So, so this is definitely my first layer. I'll be coming back with darker. And you can also get darker just by adding layers of the same on top. Um, same color that it is. A nice thing about the ink too is it's kind of nice to paint on top of it with thick paint sometimes because it'll mute your stark black line. But then you can also um, come back after everything's said and done and, and do a little bit more inking on top of your finished painting as well and get even more hashing and texture in there if you want. And this is a nice thick watercolor paper that I'm painting on at the moment. It's hot press. Um, I'm not sure what the weight is, but it's like a super thick cardstock, which I really like the heavier papers. So. I feel like they have, they're more forgiving <laughs> in some sense. And, and I actually, I haven't um, taped this down or anything. It's, it's just loose on my desk right now. And, and that's because it's the heavier paper and it can kind of take that. So I'm, I'm mixing a little bit more of this color and it's actually my base green mixed with a little bit of, um, um, blue, I think that's closer to a Persian blue. And then I'm actually, I'm gonna add just a touch of black to that just to get it a little bit more of a gray tone, a little bit more smoky there. And it's good to have a napkin nearby in case you have a lot of, of paint on your brush to just kind of dab it because you don't necessarily want it to just all over the place and you can see that shades a little different from the one that I just did but it'll be more interesting if we've got different tones of green happening at the same time this is more of a pure bright tone with that just blue and green and black that I did um, if I want that more of a muted tone then I've actually I believe what I did to make that one was I added a little bit of orange or red to it so if you're looking at your color wheel if you've got a really bright color and you want it to be not 
quite as intense, not like screaming its name out, but more just standing there and being present. And then a good easy way to mute it down a little bit is to look directly opposite on the color wheel and take a, a touch of that color and add it to it. So the opposite of green is red. And so if you add a tiny bit of red to your green, it's gonna just calm it down a little bit and, and make it a different tone. It'll be, it's really fun to play around with color and see what you can get from that. So if I've got this blue green that I'm working with right now, and if I'm thinking, gosh, that's a little too loud blue and green for me, I want it to be a little calmer, then I can go over here where I've got some orange from the past painting, reactivate it with that water and add that to this. So I'm taking the orange and adding it over. And that is just gonna calm this down a bit. You can see it a little bit. And so probably hard to see on the computer screen there, but that calms it down just enough in real life when you're looking at it that you're like, oh, wow, that really changes things. And I like having small batches of paint on my palette here so that I'm constantly forced to remix it. And each time I remix it, it's a little different this time than it was there. And, and I feel like that reflects the nature a little bit more too, is the abstract, the unpredictable, the, um, the lights hitting it slightly different over here than it was over in that part of the tree. And, and you're reflecting that a little bit more realistically almost in that sense. Um, Otherwise, if you do like a big batch of paint and you're just doing whoosh, your whole tree is all that one shade of green because you really liked it and that's what you thought spruce looked like. Well, then it's gonna be less interesting in the long run than it is to have it with all these different shades. And like this piece here is that brighter blue tone. I can come in and add the bottom branches here and have it mix right there in the paper too. And that adds even more interest. And I feel like the more interest, the better. The longer you can get somebody to, to look at a piece and think about it and stare at your art. That's kind of what we're striving for is people to stop and pay attention. So we're trying to add interest. We're trying to Say, wait, look at this again, look at this. Whoa, what's going on over there? Like, look, look how many trees are growing on that. And I can't even count them. They're all blended together. So, I mean, art is meant to inspire emotion and ideally transport your viewer to another place on some level. And here, we're wanting to transport them to cruise off so they can experience a little touch of the, the wild beauty that is surrounding us here. So I'm putting in a little bit of plant life down here. I'm actually going to use this color also in my moss just to green it up a little bit more. Add a little layer of green there. I can tell this yellow brown that I put down isn't quite dry yet on how my paint's interacting with it, but I'm okay with that. I kind of like how it's interacting. It's kind of bleeding a little bit and blending a little bit. So sometimes with watercolor, you'll have to step back and let your piece dry all the way before you add any more to it, but sometimes that's a really nice thing to do too, to give yourself a little bit of mental space and, and step away from a piece for a little bit before you come back and finish it. And I did not erase my pencil line of this drawing, so I can see that a little bit underneath. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, but it was so light that I wasn't really, it's not too distracting, I felt like. And then also 
it can kind of add some interest too. You can kind of like peer into the mind of the artist a little bit more sometimes saying like, oh wow, like that's where they were starting. And that's kind of how they started. With this, you guys get even more. You get my commentary, <laughs> live action in Salisa's mind. That's why this event is free. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna just keep adding to these trees here. If there's any other questions, jump in. I'm gonna pull some of this blue green that I mixed for another painting before up here. It's nice to have these different pockets on your palette to kind of separate your, your colors when you don't want them to mix. I'm gonna pull some of that orange over again. One interesting thing about colors, again, like I said, if you add orange to blue, you're gonna get a very muted version of whichever is the more dominant color there. Um, but in a piece, if you have orange right next to blue, then each of those colors being opposite on the color wheel will actually enhance each other and make each other look even brighter than they would naturally. And that's kind of like a little bit of an optical illusion, but one that as an artist, you can really take advantage of. Like if I've got this, this really, let's say we're painting an orange, and I really want those oranges to just like pop and be really intense on this page, then I might choose to, when I do the, le the, um, the leaf on top of the orange, I might choose to add some blue to that leaf so that it just helps that orange pop a little bit more. Or another good way to make things look even more realistic is adding a little bit of that, that blue to the shadow of the orange as well. And that will give you that, kind of muted thing that we had talked about already, but but it's still like it complements each other. And it's really interesting just the relationship that you start to see and understand a little bit more with colors, the more you you paint with them and you play with them, you experiment with them. It's a really complex um, relationship that you can start to discover on how they interact with each other. And if you do this and that, and what happens between all the different colors. Um, one thing that a friend told me once to challenge yourself a little bit with your art is, is to limit your color palette. Meaning don't use every color on your palette, but limit yourself to like three colors and see what you can do with just those three colors. And that can really be um, really educational if you're wanting to go down that route. This tree branch here, or the, um, the trunk of the tree, I actually painted that green, but I'm gonna come back with brown and do a layer of brown on top. So it will eventually be brown. Remember, after all this dries, you can add and add and add again. Um, sometimes there is a point where you've gone too far, but but it's all about the experimenting and and learning in that journey to get there. So don't be afraid to do whatever you want. Just pick up the brush and go. And we've whiled away another hour. Um, Thank you so much, Deirdre and Lisa. That was um, fascinating watching Lisa. Blah. Um, really, really enjoyed it. And I mean, I learned things and I've been painting for generations. Um, Deirdre, thank you so much. I really appreciated all you had to say. I, I still want to learn more about St. Lazaria and how St. Lazaria was formed and it's just so different than the rest of the area around there and fascinating and but um, maybe another time we can focus in a little deeper. Uh, thank you all for coming and we will hopefully see you next month uh, around I don't know if it'll be 5 30 or 6 30 but probably the second Wednesday in March um, and unless anyone has any other questions or comments we'll say good night.